welcome and to all of you who have taken seat. Welcome to today's event at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. It's great that you have all made it here to be in person in this room, but also online via the live stream. My name is Pia Völker. I work for the BUND, especially on uh, GM politics and or gene medical technology. And I'm happy to be opening it here. Today, the International Green Week is opening tonight. And this is also the starting point for our uh, event And in this uh, connection, we will talk about a controversial topic, which is uh, genetic engineering or agro uh, engineering or agro technology, and what um, we might be faced with in the EU and Germany uh, in the near future and what it might uh, entail. So, what will we be faced with, and why is it so important to talk about it today? In the past, genetic engineering was uh, treated very cautiously for good reasons. In the EU, we have a set uh, of rules for the treatment of genetic engineering, but with the upcoming of new genetic engineering technologies and the most uh, widely known as CRISPR-Cas, um, there was a quick demand or rapid demand for a, well, a reduction in the strict regulation in order to be able to put the new um, products quicker on the market. Currently, we still have the strict set of rules, but this might change because in the EU, a law-making process was launched, which might lead to a change, and a, a respective draft is being expected for the next uh, weeks. So these regulations are being discussed in a controversial way by experts, but also in the general public. But this is good because we are also affected by the consequences, also you as consumers. And the question predominantly is, should we uphold the current genetic engineering regulations and linked to it, do we need genetic engineering to cope with current crises such as climate change or also hunger, or do we need completely different, a completely different approach. So how will we in the EU deal with genetic engineering in the future? Currently, there's a lot of speculation going on, but what we can also see is that we might see a dilution of the strict uh, rules on genetic engineering. And, for example, it might well be that in the future, some of the genetic engineering techniques do not need to be labeled uh, anymore in the product or that there is no approval process uh, ne necessary anymore for putting the products on the market. So there's a lot at stake for the consumers here. Just to give you one example, later on we will hear more about it because when the labeling is being done away with, then we cannot be an informed consumer in the supermarket, for example. Current surveys show that uh, GM is basically not, or GM uh, crops are not the products that consumers want to buy. This, of course, leads to many questions, and we would like to refer to some of the questions. It's quite clear that we uh, are not able to cover the whole spectrum of the current discussion, and this is why we will focus on certain important aspects. On the one hand, it's the risks for the environment, and my colleague Daniela Wannemacher will present us a study which has just been published. And on the other hand, it is about the question, what would less regulation mean for the agricultural sector, for the farmers, for the uh, consumers? And it will also be about the question whether genetic engineering is without uh, any alternative as it is usually described. And this is what I would like to talk about with my guests. And now I would like to uh, introduce Daniela Wannemacher and Emmanuel Atamba, of whom we will hear in, in input today. I will start with Daniela Wannemacher. She is an agricultural uh, scientist. And uh, already several years ago, she looked into the topic of genetic engineering, amongst others, as a scientific assistant of Harald Ebner in the German Bundestag. Today, she's the team leader for land use at the BUND, and she's also the uh, expert on genetic engineering methods. Daniela, you will introduce to us 
the BUND study on uh, risks of genetic engineering. And before I give the floor to you, I would also like to uh, introduce Emmanuel Atamba. He is the program coordinator for the right to food and agroecology at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Nairobi. And he's also a farmer himself. And he will talk to us in a video on his experience with GM crops in Kenya and the kind of questions that have come up with regard to food safety and what is important with regard to food safety. I will just give you a brief overview of what we'll do today. We will hear the first two input inputs um, in the next 30 minutes. Then we will clarify some questions, if you have any questions concerning what you've just heard. And then we will have a panel discussion. And at the end of this event, we will still have time um, so that you can ask questions. So I would like to start, and I hand the floor to Daniela Vanamacha. Thank, Thank you so much, Pia, for your nice introduction to the topic. And I'm um, pleased myself to be able to carry out this uh, event uh, in the Heinrich Böll Foundation together with the ABL and uh, the BUND. And as Pia already rightly said, uh, just recently by the end of last year, we have published a literature review. You can see the title here on the screen. So this would be the ecological risk of the new procedures um, of genetic engineering that does not only look into the risks and threats, uh, but it depicts uh, a bit more in detail what uh, are the techniques and procedures we're talking about and what are the pros and cons and what are the political opinions and statements on that. So I don't know how much uh, you are familiar with the issue. So what is it when we talk about new genetic engineering? What is we are talking about? Um, so you might have heard about a few of those uh, abbreviations, Magnoclease, Talin, ODM, and CRISPR. As Pia said already, it's, uh, those are the most common procedures uh, that uh, change the genome and uh, lead uh, to the fact uh, that uh, the DNA is cut into pieces uh, in uh, those uh, previously anticipated uh, areas or zones. And uh, this is what uh, we use different mechanisms or nucleases for. And uh, the cells are then using their repair mechanisms. So what uh, are we causing as a mutation, so to say an error in the genome? And um, this uh, is based on the fact that uh, the repair mechanism that uh, is triggered by um, the cut DNA is a, um, a failure code. So what we work with is basically an error in the genome. So this is what those new methods were based upon, and this is what we work with. So. Um, the big uh, difference uh, to the known procedures known until now, the GMOs, is um, that uh, we have no introduction of um, external genome parts. Uh, it can, we can um, therefore uh, silence a sequence of the genome or um, smaller gene segments can be introduced uh, that uh, do not have to be of a third species. So what are the risks of this technique? So then uh, the mechanism I was just about to explain or just explained um, the uh, rupture or the cut of the DNA and the repair mechanism that is then triggered uh, while we try to repair this segment, so we are prone to different errors. So there can be errors uh, when the segments are newly introduced. And uh, it can happen that um, whenever we uh, silence uh, or mute parts of the genome, that uh, we still might have a protein expression and uh, that uh, the gene is not um, knocked out totally. And this might have uh, consequences on the metabolism of the plant as a whole. <clears throat> and then um, um, technologies of the introduction of nucleases can be used, and this uh, then can uh, lead to 
errors in the genome into unintended traits and uh, then in, in general, those are the effects. Uh, we name them on-target and off-target effects. So those are unanticipated and undesired effects on the genome. So whenever I have uh, my the mutation that I was looking for that uh, I wanted to, uh, to obtain, this of course has to be uh, multiplied in a cell culture and uh, using those cell cultures and uh, the reproduction can cause further failures or errors. And uh, what you can see here, bold letters are the risks that are new when we talk about neurogenetic engineering and uh, risks that are additional risks or um, those are risks that might have been present in the um, older technologies but might be uh, or might have more weight. So let's look into the ecological risks. There are risks that uh, are well known from uh, the older techniques of the GMOs but um, can occur with those new uh, procedures. Those might be direct effects uh, through intended new traits or because of those on and off target effects. Um, so what are we talking about? Um, previously, we knew that uh, we had maize and cotton that um, contain Bt toxins or can produce those toxins themselves against the pest infection infestation. But this does not only affect the pest that it is directed to, but it might um, as well have an effect on other insects, on other pests. And those are those bullet points uh, that uh, we put forward when we talk about genetic engineering, that we might have those indirect effects. So what goes along with the use of genetic engineering, with agriculture, with our different uh, yield and crop systems, um, or cultivation systems. And the big example is because we use it quite a lot uh, those are those crops that are resistant to herbicides. And uh, if we were to look back at the last decades of uh, um, cultivating those resistant crops, we know that uh, those goes along with a higher intake of pesticides and those resistances that can occur because um, uh, when I have um, um, but weeds uh, on the field uh, that we have to use a whole different set of pesticides or new combination of pesticides with all those consequences of uh, the environment and the insects uh, that are not pests for the plant. So what comes on top of that with the new genetic engineering is uh, that we were talking about the insect resistance. So those plants that produce their toxins against insects and the herbicidal resistances. But now uh, companies are looking into new traits, new characteristics, new features. Um, and now it's very difficult for us uh, to uh, measure or to assess what this uh, could have an effect on the ecosystem or on surrounding plants because we do not have any data at hand so far. And another big field we are talking about when uh, making use of those new technologies is the use of genetic engineering and uh, the spreading of uh, GMOs in wild populations. So this is a totally new quality because right now we were focusing more on the limited use within our agricultural crops, but now we see that there are plans to use genetic engineering in the form of gene drive to use them in mosquito populations that uh, might uh, extinguish themselves in order to um, get control of malaria, for example, malaria outbreaks. And this is then, of course, connected to totally unknown consequences of whole ecosystems and uh, quite unclear uses because we are still not aware of the fact that malaria might uh, have a different way of spreading. So we see that our new technologies might bring same risks, but as well additional or stronger risks. And uh, this has uh, been assessed by the European Court of Justice. And uh, they say that those risks when we come in genetic engineering um, back then and now are similar. We have uh, a, a very an, an aimed um, change of the DNA. And this is uh, why um, the uh, court said that new, those new products have to be um, 
limited in order to make use of the precautionary principle and uh, to was uh, be aware of our consumer protection principles. So those are the claims of the BUND. The most important uh, call or claim is um, after having reviewed the literature that uh, is something that uh, we bring together in our study. It becomes quite clear that CRISPR, genetic engineering, and um, other technologies have to be subject to the same laws and regulations. We still need to be aware of the precautionary principle. We need uh, the necessary risk assessment. We need the approval and traceability of the products and uh, labeling in order to have uh, the right to choose when it comes to consumer choice and um, as well um, when we think about our agricultural producers. So this is something we'll look into in just a second. The publication I just uh, presented briefly can be downloaded on our website of the BUND. And should you have any questions, please get in touch um, with me, myself, Daniela Vanemacher, or my colleague, Pierre Föger. Uh, we are looking forward to your questions or comment comments. And now I would like to hand over again. Well, thank you so much for introducing the topic and uh, for presenting the study just briefly and uh, the explanations on the uh, use of all the new genetic engineering. Of course, we have a lot of pending and open issues uh, and data that is missing in order to get a clear picture. I would like to give you five minutes uh, for follow-up questions after these uh, presentations and Wait a second, you will be given a mic for everybody to hear you well. Thank you. When comparing all genetic engineering and the new methodologies, you said that uh, you are staying within species. Uh, but uh, this is not true because the BT gene is not uh, a, f it is indeed a foreign. So, it's vice versa. So we are talking about a transgenetic approach in the older genetic engineering. So we had different kinds of changes. Uh, and uh, of course, it is possible that foreign genes or genome sequences uh, can be introduced or can be muted. So, OK, I wrongly understood that slide back. No. Further questions? does not seem to be the case. So thank you so much, Daniela. And uh, then we would go right to our next input from Emmanuel Atamba. He is from the Herbal Foundation in Kenya. There is a, a very harsh debate on genetic engineering because they were just uh, weakening the uh, protection clauses. Um, and in the debate, it's a lot about hunger and um, fighting against um, the situation. And uh, since he could not be here in person, he sent us a video statement. And this is what we will look at in just a second. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to comment on this uh, topic. And I want to greet everyone uh, who is watching this. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Atamba Oriedo, and I work with the Hendrik Paul Foundation uh, on the Rights to Food and Agroecology Program. I coordinate the program here in Kenya. And uh, so the topic of discussion today about new genetic engineering is a very important uh, conversation in Kenya today. Um, the ban on uh, use of genetically modified organisms, which was in place uh, for the last uh, 10 years, was just lifted in October 2022. And uh, you know this uh, started a lot of conversations again around GMOs and the questions of whether one, GMOs are necessary, whether they are sustainable, whether they are even safe for human health and uh, the environment. And I have been um, on the front line of this uh, conversation. And for me, the main key issues have always been to look at, you know, what are the bigger implications of the use of GMOs, especially in our context uh, where the ban now has been lifted, what does it exactly mean uh, for our people? And 
If, um, you know, you're very keen, you see that, for example, here in Kenya, uh, this is a um, blanket kind of approach that is applied on all genetically modified organisms. And therefore, uh, the lifting of the ban on GMOs does not necessarily mean that the other types of, you know, genetic engineering or biotechnology are restricted. They all fall within the same, uh, the same blanket, even though, uh, you know, the specific approvals for use of different uh, genetically modified organisms or, or biotechnology um, uh, techniques are limited, you know, uh, to specific applications that are looked at uh, on case-by-case -case basis. But the overall acceptance of GMOs into our food system sends a very big signal uh, to mean that even those, you know, applications uh, might be looked at with a slightly different lens than before. Uh, because this, um, you know, the government's um, lifting decision to lift the man, uh, therefore, you know, means that we have accepted as a people um, uh, to start to use GMOs, even though majority of Kenyans and majority of stakeholders still want that decision to be, you know, thought again, and and I'm not convinced that uh, you know we should allow GMOs into the country. So, what does this mean to a Kenyan farmer? What does this mean in the local context? I am a farmer also myself, and I interact a lot uh, with farmers, especially in the maize growing region where I come from. And farmers are very, very, very worried about the coming of GMOs into the market. One, there is no mechanism to actually ensure that you know there is no uncontrolled gene flow into the other you know, maize varieties that are being grown, and therefore no one is actually uh, safe from GMOs, if I can say that. Because there is no measures put in place to actually make sure that those who do not want to grow or engage with GMOs or the biotech different biotechnologies do not get affected by the same. Because when you bring them into the environment, then there are no measures. Um, even the, the, the Kenyan regulations uh, do not require, for example, uh, farmers who grow GMOs to leave a buffer. At one point, I was having a conversation with the chief executive officer of the National Biosafety Authority, and I asked, whose responsibility is it to make sure that those who don't want to grow GMOs are not affected by, you know, maybe, you know, cross-pollination and all that. And, um, you know, in that interview, he actually said that that is the responsibility of the farmer who doesn't want to grow GMOs. Uh, and, and, and I felt that was quite shocking, that now the farmers who do not want to engage with GMOs are now compounded with a challenge to try to keep their maize or their, their crops pure. The question of how the issue about control, and, and we have already started seeing this in this country, Immediately, the, the ban was lifted, I mean, the, the, the commercialization of BT cotton was allowed in December 2019, and BT cotton, uh, which is genetically modified, of course, um, with the BT gene, uh, you know, was st started to be grown. And, you know, the whole dynamic of cotton farming changed completely. Even though this is a very minor, you know, crop, if compared with, like, you know, overall crop production in the country, it's not like a very significant enterprise, but the, the questions that come from farmers and the issues that farmers are bringing out are very dire to imagine. That one, for example, you know, these cotton farmers are used to a practice where they give the cotton balls to the ginery, the ginery takes the fiber because that is what they're interested in, and then they, use, they, they take the seeds back to the farmers, and the farmers can replant the seeds. That is how they have been growing their cotton all through. Today, the generalists are not giving farmers back their seeds. Whether the farmers are growing GMO cotton, BT cotton, um, which is supplied by Mexico, uh, or they are not growing BT cotton. So the generalists are not giving the farmers seeds because in the context of GMOs, you are not allowed to replant the seeds. So therefore, they are holding the seeds at the generalists, and the farmers have to buy again their seeds. This is one thing that is really worrying because when the seeds went back to the farmers, they would repurpose them into cotton seed oil, they would repurpose them into cotton seed cake, and, and, and the seeds were definitely owned by the farmers, not by the ginery. The ginery was supposed to take the, the fiber out of the bowls and then leave the seeds back to be sent back to the farmers so that the farmers can use them either to replant or to repurpose as animal feeds or cotton seed oil, which is also edible. This is something that you know, you can already see the issues that we have about GMOs in this country. 
are really about the questions of control. The socioeconomics of GMOs do not align completely with our context. Our context, you're talking about, you know, farmers who have varying incomes, you know, and sometimes, you know, based on whatever resources they need and whatever situations they are in, sometimes farmers do not have the money to go and buy the seeds. They want to reuse the seeds they planted before or they kept before. And, and this kind of system does not allow them to do that. When you introduce GMOs into the context, into the Kenyan context, for example, the context where 80% of our food is produced by small-scale farmers, and, and, and therefore, you know, even the issues about protecting and ensuring that there is no, you know, cross-pollination, uh, which of course leads to uncontrolled gene flow, do not have, you know, a place in this country in the context that we are operating in. Therefore, the, 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 the controls that applies and, and that are supposed to apply to the people who are growing, you know, um, GMO cotton have now to be applied to everyone because there are no controls. And uh, the regulations, one of the regulations, for example, in the regulation, uh, in the registration uh, regulations, requires that whether you are growing GMOs or you are not growing GMOs, you have to test your produce and it has to be certified by the National Bay Safety Authority. So if they bring in BT maize, for example, into this country, if I want to sell my maize as free from GMO or GMO-free maize, then I still have to go to the National Bay Safety Authority. Uh, the maize has to be tested and then they have to allow me to use the label that this maize is GMO-free. You can see how you know, expensive that is. And that is costing uh, around $300 uh, to do that. $300 per sample to test and confirm that the maize is GMO-free. The same applies to those who would want to grow the GMO maize because it's not just about GMO maize, it's also about approved. What kind of GMOs have been approved? Are you growing the approved ones or are you growing a different kind of GMO? And, and therefore, the, these layers of bureaucracy that are being brought uh, you know, um, are going to really make, um, you know, uh, farming and, and, and food trade in Kenya a very tough, difficult job. And, 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 and this is where, you know, we worried as food systems experts, because when you look at what that does, leave alone the conversations we have been having about whether GMOs is safe or not, and at this point I would you know, um, jokingly say that that is not even a, the bigger conversation. The bigger conversation is what does this do to the livelihoods of the people? What does this do to the ability of consumers to access safe, adequate food? What does this do to consumer choice? Our institutions do not have the capacity to monitor and make sure that everyone has a choice to choose between GMO foods and non-GMO foods. We do not have that. The, the, the National Bio Safety Authority has only about 15 uh, or less even than 15 uh, technical uh, you know, staff. And we are talking of a country with over thousands and thousands of supermarkets and retail shops, I think tens of thousands of retail shops. Who is going to monitor to make sure that consumers are still guaranteed their choice? And whether this you know, um, measure uh, serves any purpose, it has been confirmed, it does not serve the purpose of Kenyans. It does not help us solve our food security problems because our food security problems are not about the seeds. They are not about the quality of seeds we have. They are about a lot of other issues and, and very simple issues uh, for that matter, like farmers just having the best extension services, markets being fair, uh, you know, prices being uh, consistent so that you know, someone is not selling a produce today and then after one month the price has gone up three times and they cannot afford the same produce that they, were, they sold. And the issues around GMOs in this country and the regulations that are there are likely to become even more complicated with the emerging of new technology. Today, we are being told that, you know, um, this is just the beginning. The lifting of the ban on GMOs is just the beginning. And definitely uh, genetic engineering, uh, other genetic engineering technologies, uh, gene editing, for example, are in the pipeline. And the local scientists are telling us openly that, you know, they are not interested in, um, in, in, in genetic modification anymore. They are going to bring gene editing. And in the context of discussions that we have been having, even as civil society, 
you know, the questions about crossing the gene, um, you know, uh, the, the species barrier, um, and, 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 and really introducing new uh, functions into the genome with the genetic modification, the, 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 I mean, the, the past techniques, um, you know, they're saying, okay, so you had a problem with that, now we are bringing you gene editing, we are just cutting out the bad things, we are not adding anything new. And this looks interesting to the people, this looks safe to the people, because they, they are telling the people, we are not adding anything into the gene, we are just cutting out the part of cassava gen genome that makes it produce cyanide, and therefore you can eat cassava without cyanide. And we are cutting the part of wheat that makes it vulnerable to, um, uh, uh, to, 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 to viruses, you know, and therefore you can grow wheat without having problems with viruses. At the end of the day, the goal is not to solve the problems. At the end of the day, the goal is to continue to control. And we have seen the hand of these companies already with the, the production of, of, of cotton. The game, the end game, is to control, and that I think I think that is where we need to continue to raise the profile. It does not matter how many other technologies come. The question about whether those technologies are safer than the previous technologies does not arise. The question of whether those technologies are less controversial or not. I think the real intention is still the same, and the intention is to control, and the intention is to destroy what is there so that people are left vulnerable and they are left begging, you know, uh, for these companies and these rich, um, you, know, um, you know, individuals who are controlling these companies, who control the decisions, who control the research, to continue to look important and to continue to look in charge. And, and this is something that we have to continue to raise the profile about. And, and therefore, for me, I feel that uh, even, uh, you know, as, you know, these other discussions are happening about CRISPR-Cas, about gene editing, which, the way it is described, it might look like a better option than what was there before. But I think that is not the discussion that I think for me, um, you know, um, from a human rights perspective, from a sustainability perspective, I want to be engaged in. I want to be asking the question, is it necessary? I want to be asking the question, is it worth the risk? I want to be asking the question, does it help the person who has problems accessing food? Does it help the farmers who are fighting to get out of poverty? Does it help the farmers who are fighting with the effects of climate change? Does it help to reduce malnutrition? Or it actually adds to the problems? And in truth, if you analyze it in a bigger picture, it actually adds to the problems. And therefore, I, I think we have to continue to look into this conversation with that really sharp focus on what is the end game. Because the confusion is real, and, and the interest in getting the attention of the people, even here in Kenya through using social media, through you know uh, publishing false information about GMOs, about what GMOs can do, uh, you know, they are telling people that GMOs can grow even in deserts and, 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 you know, all lies, all manner of lies. They are telling people that GMO maize can grow in two months. How is that possible? How is that possible? What part of maize growing does it reduce? Does it reduce the root development or the stem development or the stem size? There is no actual tangible benefit of moving in this direction. And that is where we have to maintain so that the people understand. Otherwise, even here in Kenya and in a lot of other African countries, the push to make genetic, genetically modified foods to look like superfoods is so high. And yet, we know very well the reverse is true. And, 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 and the solution for the problems that we have in this country are really simple and, and require political will to be addressed and not this you know, fake philanthropy uh, to basically try to say that you know, we are being given the best research, we are being given the best food. We don't want to be given, we want to own and control our food and how we produce it. And I think I'll end it there, but just to encourage us to really refocus, I think for me, my main message is to really continue to ask ourselves, why exactly are we opposed to these technologies? So that whatever technology comes on board or is brought on board, then we have a discussion around the same, the same, same issues, but of course, even as we do that, 
let us understand the science and the discussions that are there and the debates that are there. But the overall picture is, you know, why is this important and why is this necessary? Why is it being made to look necessary? Because it's not necessary to do all this. We can grow our food in a sustainable way. We can grow our food really observing, you know, the basic principles of nature and, and, and therefore not damaging our environment even further and not compromising the ability um, uh, of humans to produce food in the future. Because whatever is happening, you know, no one knows where it ends up. And, and, and really the question of sustainability is a very critical one, especially in the context of genetically modified organisms and what that does uh, to our uh, basket of, of, um, of resources in terms of genetic resources uh, that we need today and also in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, continue with the conversation. Thank you very much. Yeah, vielen Dank, Daniela und Iman. Thank you so much to Daniela and Emanuel for your input so on uh, the risks and uh, the report from Kenya. And I would now like to ask my speakers to the panel. And I would like to start out with Bärbel Endres. She is um, a member of the ABL Regional Board um, and um, Agricultural Engineer. So... For many years, you're a member of the ABL, the Association for Rural um, uh, Peasantship Working Group on Peasant Agriculture. And uh, you have been dealing with the issue of genetic engineering for many, many years. And uh, you have your own organic farm. So you're a farmer and uh, bring your own perspective here to the panel. So thank you very much for coming. And then next, uh, Carl Bear. Sorry, next one to come up here is a member of the parliament and representative of the Agricultural Committee for the Parliamentary Group of uh, the Green Party with a lot of experience in genetic engineering. So, warm welcome. Uh, warm welcome to you, Carl. Last but not least, Markus Volta, who is a speaker for agriculture and world nutrition in the organization Miseria. You bring along our international perspective. So whenever we want to show that uh, it is indeed possible to work without genetic engineering, and you brought along a few examples from India and Sri Lanka. So thank you for joining us. Manuel already referred to us. So when we talk about genetic engineering, of course, uh, we have to ask a question about the bigger picture and the, the bigger context. So I would like to address the first question to you, Carl. If you could just grab the microphone and uh, please feel free to take something to drink. Um, so a current uh, inquiry shows that uh, we have a big majority that is against uh, lowering uh, the limits or the restraints on uh, um, genetic engineering. So what is the impulse coming from to lifting the ban on genetic engineering and what parts of the agriculture would benefit from that? Just recently in uh, the parliament, uh, we had uh, a hearing on the genetic engineering and uh, another member of parliament uh, who was raised uh, in the uh, eastern part of Germany uh, wasn't really that familiar with the English language. He said and instead of crispr cas he said crispr cash. He didn't really want to say so, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, he um, tripped when uh, speaking it out, but uh, it really brings it uh, to the point because it's all about uh, having to assess uh, those products and have to label those products. And right now, we are protected by the obligation to label that is protecting us from having GMOs on our tables and on our um, plates. Uh, but uh, the European uh, law is not really anti genetic expression, but uh, we simply have to label it. And then, of course, uh, it is not bought by all those consumers who do not want to have GMOs uh, in their food. And this protects or protection might not be the right word, but uh, it avoids that those companies can make money out of it. And this is what it's all about. 
So what kind of agriculture would benefit from it? Uh, if uh, we're looking a bit closer at the debate, then uh, genetic engineering is uh, used as an argument uh, why we don't really have uh, to change a lot in agriculture, but we do have to change very much in agriculture. We have many too many um, animal-based products. We have a huge problem with biodiversity, with climatic change. Agriculture has to adjust to that and has to be adapted to that. But if we look at it, hmm, change is always quite cumbersome. Can we not simply change the genome of our cultural crops and of our animals and uh, by doing that simply solve our problems, then we have all of a sudden found an easy way to do all that and to bring about this change. So yesterday we were talking about those agricultural issues, the Green Week that is taking place right now in Berlin. And the only time that climate change has been um, named, then uh, this was in order to find the right argument for genetic engineering. So if I want to do something uh, to change agriculture, genetic engineering is the right thing. And um, we want to profoundly change agriculture. So who would benefit from it? It would benefit those people who want to stick to the status quo, but this will not really be of use for us. Thank you so much. I would like to come back to the issue of patents. Uh, we will stay with you, Carl. Excuse me. Yes, uh, you can keep the mic in your hands. So what consequence would have a further patenting of our seeds for the peasants and for the agriculture, because uh, whenever we use more GMOs or genetic engineering, we uh, need more patents. So what would this mean in practice? So I would like to take a step back from the seed companies, because uh, when we observe those new genetic methods, it's not only about plant health, it's as well all about animals. So uh, patents is not something that we can uh, find in the, the um, in, in, in the crops, but as well in animals. And um, last year, a company from the States uh, tried to, to uh, find a way to patent uh, um, cattle that uh, does not have uh, any horns. So they try to do or to simulate something that is already present in nature. So this cattle that does not develop any horns. And um, then they have tried to find a way uh, to do that technically speaking. And then this is a technological procedure. They wanted to patent this procedure. And they had all the different cattle species. And independently, if um, uh, markers of uh, the genome can be found in the cattle, that this then applies as well to those non-manipulated cattle. And this is a huge problem because uh, those uh, um, hornless cattle have been described since the times of the, the uh, ancient, uh, since the times of the ancient Rome, and um, now if I look at uh, those people working with cattle, then uh, selling those uh, bred animals um, does not. Uh, or makes a part of their income. So apart from those dairy products and the meat, um, the selling of those cattle is part of the income of those farmers. So and this is where they try to step in. When we have this small U.S. company that um, is uh, working closely with the company that uh, takes on uh, the uh, delivery of uh, sperm, then uh, they are working hand in hand in order to have this new technology patented in order they for them to claim that they produce something that is um, a, a natural uh, trade or natural feature. So um, what happens when uh, seeds are increasingly patented? This is something that we see right now, that even for small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, it is a huge challenge to find out what am I allowed to do even. So and who do I have to pay my loyalty, uh, my and my license is too, and um, my royalty is too. So, um, 
So I have to see if I have uh, a um, an enterprise that is feasibly working, and I have to find out if that is what I am using, something that I might have retrieved from older stock uh, uh, material that I use for breeding. Is this patented somewhere? Is this something that I have to pay royalties for? So before I start uh, the process, um, there might be a person that uh, would like to use uh, this material, would get some problems. Yes, the problem of the SMEs and what it really means for them is something that we look uh, take a closer look at with Babel then later on. But the last question to you, Carl, um, is referring to our federal government. Um, so. Do you think, or what do you think uh, the uh, federal government is heading towards to when it comes to genetic engineering and the collision agreement? We don't find anything, but uh, it is stated that up until 2030, um, we want to have a 30% of organic um, um, agriculture. And uh, what are those measures that uh, the federal government would try to implement uh, the objectives? And is genetic engineering really playing any role in um, well, complying with those objectives. When we look at the federal government, um, then I think it would be quite cumbersome to say that uh, the federal government uh, is a monolithic or a front. Of course, we have uh, many diverse opinions uh, between what the Liberal Party thinks, the Green Party thinks, and what the minister, Steffi Lemke, who is the minister for our environment, uh, thinks, uh, or uh, Svenja Schultz, and never has been a big fan of genetic engineering. But uh, within the government, we have a whole set of diverse opinions, but this is not really displayed in the collision agreement. So it's not one of our tasks to really change anything. So we would have to come up with this huge collision agreement that uh, stipulates everything that we do not want to see in the coalition agreement as well. There is not seen that uh, um, the uh, hunting law is supposed to be changed. And um, now during the pandemic, uh, they wanted to change parts of it, but uh, then this would really go um, against what the liberals have in mind. So it's sometimes better to not have anything included in the coalition agreement um, in order to not uh, get ourselves limited. But uh, we have to make a good assessment when it comes to the ecological transformation. I would like to do that in euros, in our currency. So when we talk about ecological braiding, we have a few of those so-called eco-freaks, uh, small-scale farmers, and with the subsidies, uh, public subsidies, uh, they make to f three to four million euros a year. And then when we look at uh, conventional braiding um, and uh, livestock farming, it's uh, 200 million euros. And uh, the proportion of state funding is a bit, is, is a lot bigger than when we compare to uh, organic farming, and if we would want to reach those 30 percent of organic farming and would like to adapt agriculture to climatic change, and we would have to do that rather earlier than later, then breeding, um, <laughs> and then I would have to invest into breeding. And for organic farming, it's uh, a great thing when uh, those um, yeah when the organic farming is taking place under those conditions this is something that should be um, should be discussed and uh, where the federal government should invest into and we should create the right structures in order to make this possible breeding is something that goes uh, of many different years. And uh, one of the myths of genetic engineering is that uh, this finally accelerates the process. Uh, but um, um, the uh, genetic scissors, uh, so to say, does not do away with our season. So if we want to have organic farming, we need the right structures in order to have a long-term perspective for people who work in the business. Thank you so much as well for uh, the uh, uh, bigger picture that you allowed us to take uh, a look at, and uh, Emmanuel referred to it as well. And now I would like to switch to the more local experience, uh, and therefore I would like to ask you the next questions, Berber. So the 
the lifting of the restrictions or for genetic engineering uh, supposes a big risk for those people working in the agriculture, maybe organic farming or conventional farming. You know this yourself because you're a farmer yourself and you have your own farm. What are you producing? Yes, that's true. I'm a farmer myself and we have eggs and uh, laying hens. Uh, we have the solidarian agriculture. We have Christmas trees. Uh, so we are quite diverse in what we produce. So you told me that uh, you've uh, been politically active for the last 30 years and uh, as well as a member of the AB of the Working Group on Peasant Agriculture. In the last year, you have set up a letter to your colleagues uh, and I have brought it along. So you have the possibility to read this letter outside of this lecture hall. And in this letter, it is stated uh, so if uh, we do not raise our voices now with genetic engineering, we will lose our jobs, uh, our farmers. And um, how, how, did it, how did this letter come about? Um, yes, this letter was uh, drafted because, uh, as I told you, I was a part of the debate of genetic engineering for quite some time. And for one and a half years, I have uh, intensively observed uh, uh, what is going on, have been part of many online events, have read many articles on the uh, topic, and um, I've seen that uh, we have uh, a discussion that is not putting the focus on the, what the problem really is, which is um, the uh, lifting of uh, the genetic engineering ban or the softening of the law. We are talking about climate adaptation, about uh, hindering research and so on. And I would simply like to put forward uh, that we do have the possibility to cultivate uh, GM crops. So we can do research, we can launch, we could put it on the market. Uh, we have the possibility to have our producers approved, but uh, this is not the reason. The problem is uh, what we've seen in the debates is uh, that uh, they do not want to talk about rules and uh, the consequences that those rules uh, will have. And then the promises being made on one hand, do they have anything to do with those rules on the other hand? Uh, so this is something that uh, is quite appalling because uh, whenever I am part of those online discussions and I have made those follow-up questions of how about this coexistence, uh, then uh, they were simply trying to do away with it and said, OK, so this is uh, one of those hot topics and they simply do not want to talk about it. And uh, so when we always stay on the general level, then it's all fine. But if you dig deeper, it's like when you go to the doctor and um, so he taps your leg or your um, your arm uh, so for you not to, to notice uh, the pain when uh, you are um, um, getting your injection. So this is the same thing here in this uh, regard. So this is the precautionary principle of the EU. So simply for you not to feel the pain. And I myself, I'm a farmer, so I've become aware that uh, as long as uh, we are leading those debates on that level, people are not really seeing what is happening and how our democracy is attacked. And uh, I have a long history in agriculture. I've studied agriculture from scratch and uh, the same companies that are now um, trying to be granted the pant patent uh, are telling us for the last 40 years that we are not able to work without pesticides. And now they're telling us we are not able to work without uh, GM um, crops. And uh, those are the same legends and myths that they are telling us once and again. And then I've seen it in colleagues uh, that uh, we don't want that. We don't even need it uh, or we don't need to use it simply. And they say, OK, that's true, but uh, they want uh, to take the choice of a view that you don't even know what you are planting. 
Of course, it's not lucrative when those companies make their patents and then in the end nobody buys it. Uh, so this is the reason why uh, we don't have any GM uh, crops uh, because uh, the company said that uh, the market opportunities are not really that good. It does not have anything to do with research. You can launch your products uh, and uh, those are those um, wrong arguments uh, brought forward uh, by those experts. Um, but this is not true. You have the possibility to plant to cultivate and to do research. It's all there. And who wants to um, cultivate can do whatever he wants, but he has to abide by the rules. And then um, became obvious that in those debates, we hardly have any representatives of uh, small scale production who know what they're talking about. And they are trying to avoid the issue of coexistence at any cost. And um, so the only ones who are able to tell us how they feel and what the consequences are, 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 are we, we, the farmers. We are the first ones who are affected uh, by the crops. Uh, we are the ones who are supposed to cultivate those crops and have to bear the cost, the social cost as well. And this is why we boiled it down to those uh, bullet points, um, the way it is uh, shown now. So when we are trying to get into labeling, then they simply take away our freedom of choice to know what kind of seeds we are buying. So we simply do not have the choice to decide what we want to buy. And then uh, they um, take the choice of the consumers. So representing the companies I am supposed to sell all this stuff to people. And this is not something that we want to do. And the problem in all that is uh, in labeling uh, so thinking about labeling the seeds but not the final product. So this means for us that uh, this is a battle that uh, we are about to lose. And the smaller the structures are in the agriculture, the faster they are wiped off the ground. So if we are to deregulate, um, so if we are lifting the obligation to label and um, the uh, evidence procedures or the te detection methods, um, and this is clearly against biodiversity and the smaller farmers or the smaller production sites will not be able to um, go along with it. And then uh, the genetic engineering will have as a consequence is that small scale uh, peasants uh, will not be able to work anymore. So let's look at what market is left there. So the organic farming is affected. 80% of our colleagues producing dairy products uh, um, don't uh, want to cultivate uh, or don't want to work with GMOs. Um, and uh, in Europe, we only have Spain and Portugal making use of uh, genetic engineering because we don't have any consumers. European consumers do not want to have any GM food on their tables. And this is the market they want to break up. And this is why they try to attack labeling. So there is no rationale about it. Mm. Yeah, vielen Dank. Letter, because I was wondering when I read the letter, what was the response amongst the farmers? I mean, you sent it around. What was the feedback that you got? What's the mood like? Well, colleagues weren't really aware of it, and now more and more are telling us that's impossible, that shouldn't happen. Is it really that bad? So these, the smokescreen discussion is really keeping us from the essential. Uh, we should look at what they are actually doing there. And now this is increasing. And I hope that all the colleagues, as we have said, make their voice heard, participate in the debate. Um, but I also like to say that this Letter. I mean, it's also about the patents, as uh, Karl Beer has already mentioned. This patenting of seeds is already a big problem. In the EU, the patenting of conventionally 
uh, developed seed is theoretically impossible only if it's a, a GMO product. But nevertheless, over the past years, many patents were accepted. And n now, maybe in the hope uh, for deregulation, more and more patents are being accepted. We have a conventional uh, breeding here. Um, and they simply say that it was created with a new uh, GM technology or genetic engineering technique, uh, even though it is not. So this means that the breeders who would like to uh, use this, these seeds are allowed to use them for research purposes. But when they put it on the market, then immediately the corporation will approach them. And this led to a situation in which many colleagues said, we are not trying to breed this trade or that trade because there's a patent on it. So it limits our f future ability to breed seeds because we have to leave it to the major corporations um, due to the patents. And when it comes to risk assessment, when it, it's always been the case, they s also with the pesticides, they said, well, it's no problem at all. Glyphosate, DDT, not a problem at all. That's what they always said. And we, the farmers, are actually the lab rats. So if I do not want to have this stuff on my fields, but eventually, uh, uh, we see this risk. Then, um, of course, this is something that we wanted to warn our colleagues of. Well, this is a good uh, argument. You are talking about liabilities and costs because you end up with these costs and this liability. Yes, exactly. This is already the case today. We have, we hardly grow it, but there is cross pollination or. Um, contamination because we have a zero, zero tolerance, so it happens with maize or other crops. And if you detect a contamination, then it needs to be destroyed. And then the question eventually is, who is going to pay for it? Who is going to pay cover the costs? Usually it's the general public, as with the um, medical drug scandals, for example, the large corporations are managing to get around it, and so the general public has to pay it. And so I, and this is what Manuel has already explained, we permanently have to test our products on our own account, and if we find something, then we have to try to find out who's liable for it. But through um, test cultivations or other um, things, we end up with contaminations, and this has an impact on many of us. But it's not that bad as in, in other regions, so it's still limited to a certain extent. Thank you very much for your practical uh, insights, your practical view. It already shows us how uh, consequential a deregulation would be for all of us, and thank you for the for describing it in so much detail. I think you can now well imagine the situation, Marcus. I would like to um, approach you with the next questions. Well, Svenja Schulz, our development minister, a few days ago said that there is no GM plants in the world that effectively fight hunger or can be used to fight hunger. So I would like to briefly look back with you. In many countries of the world, GM crops are being cultivated. So what's the role of the GM crops when it comes to fighting hunger or food security? Because hunger and climate change or fighting climate change is uh, basically the major argument that is being made um, now. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this panel. And maybe I would like to give you a few figures. So acutely, we have 345 million people who suffer acute hunger and 830 million people who are suffering from food insecurity. These are the figures of 2022. 
um, these are the latest figures. We have so much GM uh, crops on the ground as never before, but the people are suffering from hunger even where there is GM. Uh, people are hungry because of the four Cs, which is conflict, so where we have a um, violent conflict, people suffer COVID, but people cannot work, cannot go to work or market their products or not leave their house, there people suffer from hunger because there's no possibility of selling products. Then climate, well, people are most affected from the climate crisis. Um, and we will talk about it in a minute uh, again. And then the cost. So the war in Ukraine has led to an extreme uh, price spike in nitrogen and other substances, um, and also uh, energy prices. For example, when you need energy to cook, I mean, you need energy to cook, and um, this is something that many poor people lack. So hunger is a poverty problem. So over the past years, or in the past, we never had uh, an insufficient amount of food. And a very good example is, and, and genetic engineering has nothing to do with hunger. One example is Brazil. Brazil is a state in which we see an intensive spread of uh, GM crops. It started in the 1990s or 2000s, and there was the so-called Roundup Ready soy, which was uh, herbicide resistant um, based on the old system, and it this was uh, cultivated almost 98% of all cultivated soy in Southern America is uh, genetically engineered. And Brazil right now has 33 million people who are suffering from hunger. This is one third of the German population which does not know how to get the food for the next day. 125 million, this is more than the population in Germany, who are suffering from food insecurity, so they do not know how they can survive the next week. And this is a country where GM crops are considered the big thing in the agricultural sector because this agriculture actually destroys the agriculture that provides for uh, food. So. Usually, the debate is high as Loden with a lot of morale and, and it, um, people sell, well, it's about global hunger, so it cannot get bigger than that um, when you uh, make the case um, for GM crops. And especially as Miserio and as a Catholic organization, when we say, well, um, maybe you've done something wrong, then we are considered anti-Christian already. So I have to deal with these kind of counter-argumentation. And secondly, quite a current example, in Argentina, we have wheat, not only soy, and 80% and, um, is ending up as a food for as f um, animal feed. And in Argentine, we have uh, seen cultivation and of wheat, and it's about a herbicide resistance. And this wheat is predominantly exported. So this procedure has not led to a situation where farmers can feed themselves well or the community. It is just being exported. And we could go on and on. Latin America, is, of course, is an extreme example. And we've already heard the colleague from Nairobi. Of course, there are other countries, too. However, the mechanisms behind that um, are quite similar. And in the past, it was well said, well, north and south, everything's so different. But what we see is a homogenization of the problems because the solutions that are being proposed in the agricultural sectors are very similar and where they lead to monocultures and dependencies. And we are actually within a dependency crisis. We are not in a hunger crisis. We are producing sufficiently for everyone, but we are in a dependency crisis from a natural gas, nitrogen, pesticides of an agriculture that has went into one direction direction, which was actually focusing on monocultures. And this leads to problems. And of course, genetically and genetic engineering will not get us out of it. Well, you talked about Brazil and Argentina. I would like to talk about India for a moment. In our uh, briefing, this morning you said that uh, you were there uh, during a project. Um, and India is, apart from China, 
one of the most populated countries in the world. The population is even growing further. So there's a high pressure in India to provide food for the whole population. And you were there in the projects. So why is it worth it to look at India in the current discussion when it comes to food security and especially when it comes to uh, genetic engineering? Well, it's worthwhile looking at India. I was there in December and November, four weeks. Uh, I was traveling around uh, in India and Sri Lanka. And um, this April, China, uh, sorry, India will have more inhabitants than China next April. Uh, next April. So 1.4 billion people. And they managed to do it. And I would like to come back to Brazil for a second. Brazil did not want it for political reasons that everyone is able to um, self-sustained with good food. The old president did not want to. I mean, there was a lack of political will. I mean, he used um, hunger as a political weapon. And Lula, once again, um, and I said this is also connected to the political will, to, to reduce the hunger. And in India, they managed to do it through numerous, countless programs, which are quite effective. I was quite impressed that the state manages to provide everyone who wants to with a relatively sufficient a level of food supplies. So in this crazy uh, country, there's almost no hunger, which is quite impressive. However, they are afraid. They are afraid that this climate crisis, which affect all the countries of the global south, no matter where I am, in Asia, Africa, South America. So the first thing that the farmers tell me there is that uh, the climate crisis has reached them. So they don't understand why we are still discussing it, because they are already suffering under the climate crisis. So the four Cs are the reason why we do not have sufficient food supplies in certain areas. So apart, I mean, India um, is a good example, and they also grow uh, cotton, which uh, also um, led to a certain degree of uh, dependency. And the, um, the GM companies, um, they managed to get the approval for mustard seeds. However, uh, I mean, this does not seem to be spectacular, but mustard oil is like um, sunflower oil with us or other oils. So they produce a lot of mustard seed oil, and there's been an approval for GM uh, mustard oil. Uh, seeds and the strategy behind is similar to the strategy in Germany. So the corporation tried to select one species, um, one crop, and when they are successful, then this has opened the door. So this is basically the strategy behind it. The argument usually is, well, we can increase the crop yield and fight climate change, which is really bullshit because the um, the species that they've used as a comparison is completely, I mean, they, you cannot compare it with it. There are also hybrids um, with a good yield, three and a half to four tons per hectare. This is good yield. Um, however, this reference variety has achieved much less, and they refer to it, and they say we have changed it genetically, and genetically modified it, and now we have a higher yield. So this is simply a strategy that we have to uh, see. We have to um, understand how the argumentation uh, is. And uh, it's quite clear that we've now opened up a door. And so in India, we will also see, I mean, what we've seen throughout the world, um, that dependencies will grow and also the input of um, means uh, will increase, like pesticides, etc. Thank you very much. You always took up your microphone. Do you want to um, reply to that? Oh. Um, mustard is a crossbreeder, which, or cruise sheaf rose, um, which is um, highly problematic um, in terms of crossbreeding. And when the yield is low, I mean, I'm not sure how the patent rights are there, but this will quickly lead to a cross. Um, cultivation, cross-pollination, and you know how small um, uh, it is, how small the mustard seeds are. They can be transmitted by 
animals or just lying around. Um, so mustard seeds is highly problematic in the uh, in genetical engineering segment. So I can only think that this is a deliberate contamination strategy by the GM corporations. Thank you very much. We have uh, 15 minutes left, I guess. And Marcus, thank you very much, first of all, for your examples and also the overall picture. And I would like to briefly uh, give you the opportunity to react to the other panelists. And uh, then I would also like to open up uh, for questions from the audience. So do you have any questions, then please raise your hand or, first of all, would you like to comment on previous statements of the other panelists or follow up on something, um, compliment uh, some statements? Just a technical remark which has not been mentioned also in terms of the climate. I mean, usually it's being said, well, apart from the conflicts, one major uh, issue in terms of hunger is the climate and that we need heat tolerant water tolerant drought resistant uh, plants but in terms of these traits it's not uh, only on in one genome so Daniela has already mentioned the technical aspects of it so it's a highly complex um, system so you, it's not like the color of your eyes so when it comes to heat resistant plants this is not existing in just one genome. So CRISPR-Cas cannot do it. I mean, we cannot look into the future whether it will be possible to insert these traits uh, in the next 15 years. However, um, we have not yet fully understood the genome, not at all, quite the contrary. So we cannot have such a target like heat resistance and that we um, create this in a plant. So everything that is being uh, conducted research on this applies to India, Brazil, and other countries with soy, wheat, or mustard. It's about um, pesticide resistances in order to keep up certain production systems. And it's not really about tackling the problems that we see in the agricultural sector, which are there, and which could also be addressed with uh, ecological um, breeding. Um, or organic breeding, so no question. However, this, this technology is simply the wrong path. Maybe just two aspects. Uh, when we talk about climate adaptation, that this only works uh, when we uh, really look at a narrowing of what climate change is, because it is a huge difference for a plant if there is enough rain in April and in August sufficient or vice versa. And uh, all the more if uh, we look at uh, what climate change uh, signifies for us uh, when we talk to farmers here in Europe, then we might have three drier years that I hardly able to work the land, and then I have three years where I can basically swim on my fields because they're flooded. So um, this is uh, something that uh, we have to take into consideration. And uh, then apart from those uh, aspects on pesticide tolerance and uh, production of own in uh, sect toxins, uh, then we have a different uh, area where I see those uh, GM crops getting to the market because they seem to be consumer-oriented uh, traits, like a pink pineapple. Wouldn't it be great to have a pineapple that comes in different colors? And carrots, we see it in organic farming that they have different colors. It seems to be quite normal. But um, let's say we have an apple that does not uh, become brown. Then you can cut it up and uh, then can sell it like gummy bears in uh, small bags. And this is something that uh, um, comes along when we talk about restructuring agriculture where it's all about uh, increased uh, sellability of those products in the supermarket. This is something we can make money off, and uh, this is something that sells. I don't really know if anybody would eat it. An apple that doesn't is not subject to oxidation, that it's quite weird if we think about not noticing when it becomes old. But this is ideal for industry. An apple that does not rot, that is perfect for further processing. I can simply simulate that uh, this is a fresh produce, which is it not, uh, which is it is not. Uh, I can store it for longer. Of course, uh, this is to the benefit of many people, but not to the consumers. 
lifestyle products, of course, would be another option. So, but this, of course, has nothing to do with uh, fighting hunger or climate change. And if we look at uh, what's already on the market, uh, then uh, we're already there. So the promises are there. And we built the bridge to the question of who would benefit from all that. Uh, and uh, the remaining time, I uh, uh, would like to use four questions from the audience, should there be any. This is just a comment. Harald Müller is my name. I'm a historian, but uh, already a pensioner. And I would like to refer to Prometheus and the fire. The fire is an enormous advantage and progress for the whole of humanity. It enables us uh, to live in a climate where we would not be able to live in. So we create our own microclimate, because otherwise we would have to go back to where we came from, to the African continent. But on the other hand, it is a huge destruction potential that uh, we have created in arms like the atomic bomb, in the residues of uh, nuclear power plants. And uh, so the uh, responsibility that we have to take on making use of this potential, the same mechanism applies to new technological um, developments. So on one hand, we have the pandemic we're still stuck in. We only have overcome this pandemic with new developments in research and science. But on the other hand, the pandemic itself shows what can happen when things go wrong. So this is a, a horrendous weapon that can put the existence of the whole of humanity in the question. So uh, I'm not a, f a favor of very strict controls in the whole sphere. So thank you so much for comparing. I've lost sight of who raised his or her hand. I think here's the next question. Uh. My name is Nick Humpel. I'm uh, rather negative when I think about uh, our possibilities, when I look at how the agricultural lobbyists uh, work uh, and how they're active in our mainstream media on uh, our newsreel, uh, uh, we have uh, seen an accomplishment of uh, those critics of genetic engineering that have been placed close to those uh, in favor of conspiracy theories. And I really do have a hard time seeing of where we can step in and how those uh, mainstream media can really be of use. I do not want to attack on mainstream media because I, this is something that usually people do. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, try to depict our mainstream media as uh, not serious enough. But the same article had been published in the Spiegel and the FAZ. So right now we are seeing a massive campaign, of course, um, as a consequence of the war in Ukraine and what's been said by Markus Wolter, that uh, the hunger crisis is always uh, referred to as the argument. And this, of course, is uh, strengthened or um, has been aggravated by the Ukraine crisis. And uh, so hunger is abused in order to defend this new system of agriculture. And it's not only about GM crops. Uh, it is also about uh, uh, stabilizing the uh, industry that uh, sells uh, the fertilizers, which all is counterproductive in a debate where we see that the energy input and the resource input in our system has to be reduced in order to become more independent and uh, not uh, to stick to the system, to use the energy that uh, we don't even have. I think we have to be a bit cautious when we talk about not having a hunger crisis. It's true that uh, from uh, the 
viewpoint of the production. We do not have the Sangha crisis, but if, and this is the way we have to think, if this massive input of resources in the system that we have to reduce, when we were to deduce this resource input, then I do think that we are facing a situation where we indeed have to think about how we produce the amount that is needed. So I think we have to think of how we can intensify organic production. We need an organic intensification, so we have to increase production with mixed crops, uh, agroforestal systems, because the system we have right now if we were to deduce the massive input of resources, then we would not uh, have a situation where there's enough for everyone. May I just briefly hmm. intervene? So we might uh, just hear this last person out and then Michel Kula. Last autumn, there was a hearing in the EU Parliament, and the argument uh, of uh, provability was put forward. So it would not be able to be proven if uh, we are to change or modify those uh, organisms. It uh, would not be able. We would not be able to detect. So when this new gene is introduced, uh, would and simply disappear. So we. We don't have any possibility of detection. Okay, so we collected those two questions. I would like to make a short cut, if that's fine with you, because we are close to running over time if we don't stop here. And uh, Babel, you've already grabbed the mic. Would you like to start out? Yes, thank you. So we have a final round. Nick Humper. that we have to be cautious when it comes to hunger crisis. So 60% of our uh, fields uh, have uh, go into feed, into animal feed. And um, I think this is something that we might have to change. And the use of the consumption of animal protein has to be reduced in the whole Western and Northern world. And uh, by doing that, we would have achieved, yes, uh, already quite a lot. So um, uh, cereals have not to go to our uh, tanks, but uh, to the plate and uh, less animal protein and um, less waste. And what you said, so uh, that many media have this quite uncritical stance. And uh, uh, when I look at uh, what Ms. Nusslein Vollhardt is saying, He uh, does not really have a profound idea of what agriculture is all about. He simply uh, disseminates uh, wrong facts. But uh, what we have to do is we have to bring this debate to the um, public. Because right now we have this uh, discussion uh, that uh, um, is not really perceived by the public. We only have this smokescreen discussion. And Jennifer Dugner was talking about uh, involvement uh, in uh, evolution. I don't know if they are still have the right or they still have the patents. They said that uh, this. Um, intervention is so deep that we need a public discussion of where we make use of it. So even those who invented the technology are warning to simply go ahead with it. So therefore, this is something where we need a debate about. And when it comes uh, to detection, I might be able to say something, but maybe the others might step in here. Try to be brief when it comes to detection and so I might uh, want to bring those two together. I was a bit surprised by 
having him brought us. So, so we have a nice technology with CRISPR-Cas. Uh, if we look at it uh, closely, there is a lot of uh, technological progress in it. But the same thing we do in medicine in order to build new proteins that have certain features or to do away with uh, certain side effects, that there is a huge potential in it. And um, the risks uh, that we have looked at for agriculture do not come from making use of the technology, but from the social um, environment of the agriculture. And um, from the fact that uh, we are not looking at laboratories, but we're looking at whole ecosystems. Uh, so while well, we have a different way of looking at um, error margins. Where I lack understanding is uh, that uh, exactly those who have confidence in solving all those problems with our technological solutions, that, uh, but that we don't have any technological development um, to be able to detect this change in the genome. It's something that I fully like understanding for. And we had another event uh, where people were totally in favor of uh, GM crops. And uh, somebody from the Helmholtz Institute said, uh, wouldn't it be able to sequence uh, uh, quite easily? Uh, yeah, we can do that. And uh, the detection method should be possible in uh, quite soon. And so this is something that uh, uh, can help us in conventional breeding, that uh, we are quite confident that uh, the detection will be possible. And um, one of those few plants around the market, uh, a detection method will be developed. And we asked people who developed it how much this cost, and they told us so it is a five-digit number. So this is a very bad argument that detection will not be possible. So um, this is a debate that we've led back in 2018. So world hunger or world nutrition, I would like to say that uh, the government does some good things. Svenja Schult and Jem Oestemir do um, promote it. And Steffi Lemke said that um, rapeseed oil and uh, cereals are used uh, in fuels, this is something that we want to stop. So this would uh, give us millions of hectares uh, of quite good arable land uh, that we would win over when not using these resources anymore in fuels. And so the discussion on genetic engineering uh, could not be led 20 years ago if wouldn't have had, have had the media that are independent of advertising customers or a Murdoch or a Bertelsmann owned company, but those media that we are paying with our monthly income. So this pops up in many discussions. So why do we have this strong uh, an environmental movement? Uh, why are so many people against uh, TTIP? Because we have this public broadcasting service that are independent of uh, market-related uh, payments. And uh, so um, I would be quite cautious when I talk about our public broadcasting service. And I think this debate has to be led on a different level. Because when I see people sitting around uh, that are politically active, then the next time you have the possibility to have uh, the, um, a date with Ophelia Nick from uh, the agricultural minister or to print out the letter and uh, to, to um, drop it in the different uh, post boxes, then please take the letter and not the minister's state. Marcus. Thank you so much that uh, I was given the possibility to talk about this issue that is quite an important one and that's finally reached the media. Um, and I can only say from my perspective, from my experience, I see that uh, uh, we have possibilities, we have the opportunities with uh, the, uh, um, the need and uh, 
the uh, the willingness to feed people. This is all possible without uh, genetic engineering. I and I'm quite confident that this will be possible in the future. So I'm not really that worried. We simply have to take it up. And uh, of course, uh, the human right um, for food is harmed or is damaged, and this is something that we have to keep on fighting for. So thank you so much for this final round. I'm shut off already. <laughs> So what we want to take home is that we might have to think about what kind of agriculture we want to see and uh, we need, and uh, that this debate on new genetic uh, engineering will entail new discussion or needs new and more debates, more public debates. And uh, with that, uh, we have already come to the end. Thank you so much for your inputs, for the discussion, and uh, a nice evening to all of you.